Welcome to this week's episode of Being Human. I'm here with Tom Zaki. He's the founder and CEO of Terra Cycle. Uh, Tom, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. So I, I first got connected to, to you uh, through Kim Pullman's book, uh, Imaginal Cells, uh, which is a collection of essays uh, centered around this idea of the, of the golden rule. Uh, and perhaps we can talk a little bit about that. And then I've, I've since explored what TerraCycle is about and what a uh, sort of an inspiring venture you've, you've created. Um, should, should we start with uh, this idea of, of the golden rule and the piece that you wrote in that, in that book? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I uh, fundamentally, you know, believe in this and in, 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 in the idea Kim is, uh, you know, putting out there and promoting, especially in the context of, of business, you know, this uh, concept that if you, are good, good things happen, you know, the, and really in a more concrete way to lead with purpose. Um, and one of my big challenges, I think, with capitalism overall, and I'm a capitalist entrepreneur, I think these are very important constructs to, you know, create new ideas, social mobility is the sort of, you know, serving the God of profit is the only focus, right? Um, when, you know, I, I, for us, I really believe deeply that uh, business should be in the business of what it produces or what service it provides and how those products or services help the world, uh, whether society or the environment be better. And then how can you do that uh, at a profit more as an indicator of health than the reason of being? And uh, that approach, you know, sort of ironic to how sort of warm and fuzzy it sounds, has actually allowed us to grow and be more successful uh, than not. Uh, so I think it really self-enforces if you think about these principles in the right way. Yeah, so they're entirely compatible with capitalism. Is, is that what you're saying? And re ironically, reinforces capitalism and growth and P and L and so on. You know, you get with 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 amazing oozing purpose. Uh, you unlock uh, more doors at organizations uh, than you ever could. Uh, you have access to, you know, folks that you wouldn't otherwise. You uh, recruit amazing people. Uh, uh, you know, who are willing to come work for you. Uh, uh, and maybe take certain sacrifices, whether it's location or salary. Um, uh, you know, the media uh, loves you uh, more. I mean, everything reinforces to allow you to accomplish that purpose easier. Right. And so, so that's how you translate. So the, 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 the golden rule, do unto others as you would have done unto yourself. Uh, and that translates for you into having oozing purpose. I love that. that uh... Yeah, it, it does. And, you know, it's great because it's a great way, reason to wake up, uh, get out of bed and come. Um, you know, and, and yes, you know, you, in, in, if you have a four business construct, you know, you do get monetary reward, but it's much more important to, you know, on, on what is that daily need of why are you doing this and what are you doing and do you feel good about it? Right. And what is your oozing purpose, Tom? <laughs> yeah, um, so for us, uh, TerraCycle is all about, uh, I mean, we're a waste management company uh, uh, and our mission is to eliminate the idea of waste. And uh, to do that, uh, we have three uh, major business units. Uh, the first one asks the question, is that object recyclable, whether it's a dirty diaper or a cigarette butt or a piece of chewing gum or you know, chip bag, you name it. And we, uh, if it isn't, we set up national programs so that we can collect and recycle it. Uh, all over the world, we're now in 21 countries running these national systems. And then our second uh, you know, approach is how do we start integrating waste back into products uh, like ocean plastic into shampoo bottles or festival waste into deodorant containers and so on. And then our third uh, unit operates under the Loop brand. And it's all about how do we move from disposable consumption to reusable uh, consumption uh, while really maintaining the benefits of disposability, which is affordability and convenience. So simply speaking, it's, you know, imagine your uh, Haagen-Dazs ice cream is now in beautiful reusable stainless steel or your, um, you know, Pantene shampoo is in now reusable aluminum. Uh, that you can access through your favorite retailers uh, wherever you are in the world. Right. Okay. Um, so are those real examples then of what you've done with Loop and other businesses? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, all those things. I mean, we now are recycling, you know, diapers in Amsterdam to, uh, you know, uh, making head and shoulder bottles out of ocean plastic to, yes, you know, absolutely reusable uh, Haagen-Dazs to Pantene and hundreds and hundreds of other uh, products of these large organizations. And I think as it pertains to you know, things like the golden rule, what I found is really interesting is that even in these large organizations, which many times are criticized for you know, how they act or you know, the decisions they take, even there internally, they're looking for purposeful 
of things. They would like to accomplish their goals through purpose much more than through things that are neutral, you know, to world or society, like just, a, you know, an advertisement uh, promoting performance. Um, and if you can show it to them in the right way, they will absolutely gravitate to such activities. Right. And a key to this, and it was something that struck me when I was reading your article, was this idea of valuing waste, or, or as you say, eliminating the idea of, of waste, because you, you articulate in your essay that one of the things that businesses do is that if, if they look at the equation and they say, well, can we, can we create something out of recycled material, or can we create it out of virgin materials? And if it's cheaper to create it out of virgin materials, then the God of profit dictates, I must, I must create it out of virgin materials and that whole cost uh, to society potentially of you taking those virgin materials is not passed on to the business right that's that's externalized i don't exactly. have to carry that as a business so so how are you helping businesses flip that equation it's a really good point yeah you've nailed it on its head you know what makes something recyclable is whether a garbage company can make money you know what uh, uh, derives whether people use recycled content is whether it's cheaper than virgin content and in most cases a lot of the externalities that should make recycling more favorable or recycled content more favorable are not present in the business equation. Um, they've been uh, removed, right? And we pay for them later, but the organizations who make the decisions don't have to pay for them immediately. And so the trick, if you will, uh, you know, that we try to do is we try to show them that, wait, if you um, spend more to recycle something that otherwise wouldn't economically be recyclable or spend more to integrate recycled content uh, versus you know the price of virgin by adding purpose you know to your product uh, you can uh, uh, find other points of value so if for example a company puts say something like uh, a unique material like ocean plastic into its dish soap uh, like we did with fairy or uh, shampoo bottles and you know which we did a number of brands like herbal essence and so on they can lower their marketing expenditure because the earned media and social media the people will do it for them out of love which is a much more powerful uh, form of communication than paid 30 second spots on something like say uh, let's just go over to recycling and you say diaper recycling you know when a when a company, you know, puts out a platform to recycle diapers, the, uh, the, the consumers, the you know, individuals will love that brand more and gravitate to that brand. And the shift in market share will make that decision to fund diaper recycling a profitable exercise. It's too bad, right, that we have to frame everything in, uh, in how does it uh, support profit. But it can be done. Uh, and, uh, you know, these drivers are very powerful. Uh, and can be shown in these traditional business contexts. And that allows, you know, the organizations to shift their practices. Right. And, and I can see that. And I can see how it, it takes a bit of trust and a little bit of faith. Um, but I suppose these, why these things hang together. But if you're true to your purpose, then, then that will allow you, give you the momentum to take that kind of risk and, take, and, and put your faith in that process, right? Yeah. You know, you have to, um, I mean, it's taken us 17 years to come to where we are today. So this is not something that, you know, sort of we, uh, figured out and it started working. It's uh, we clumsily sort of stumbled in, made a lot of mistakes, and sort of understanding the dynamics um, of uh, of how to really, especially for us in the context of waste, that is, to embed uh, purpose into large organizations. I mean, even you know the ones you'd never expect: big oil, big tobacco, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, big pharma. You know, all these sort of sectors that you would think you know may not be as in tune with this type of thing. Right. And has that been one of the big surprises for you then, that these unlikely candidates have got on board? Well, it's one of the things that delight me the most. You know, I, I, uh, I get excited about the things people don't think are possible. So if it's waste streams, you know, when people ask me, like, what type of things am I most excited about, you know, collecting and processing? It's the things that are very taboo, like um, used tampons and pads or used chewing gum or cigarette butts or dirty diapers, right? So it's the taboo thing because people don't believe it's doable. In the world of uh, corporate partnerships, it's the same. You know, uh, uh, I'm actually very proud that we work with many of the big tobacco companies around the world to bring robust cigarette recycling um, because you'd never expect it. You know, that's an industry that is almost black and white painted as negative. Um, and I'm not advocating in any way for smoking. I think the best way to solve cigarette waste actually is to stop smoking. You know, but 20% of the uh, human population smokes today. Uh, uh, and that's a big number. And uh, it's the number one most littered waste stream in the planet are cigarette butts. And so, you know, for me, the question is, I'm not going to really be able to, in my little you know, position, be able to change 
uh, you know, uh, uh, people's perspective on the uh, topic, many incredibly large organizations have done really good work to do that. Um, but what I can at least do is get these organizations to put the resources not into maybe promoting more consumption, but to helping clean up the problem. And that, you know, is, uh, uh, is, is a fantastic, uh, you know, I mean, we feel really good about that. Right. Right. So, so you said 17 years you've been going at this. Yeah, yeah. that's right. And I saw that on your website in 2018, what was it, 20 million in revenue and a net profit of over a million? Yeah, yeah. And last year, what did we do? About 50 million and about six, seven million in profit um, wow. overall. Um, now, here's an important point on how we view profit as well, right? So I was, uh, I remember this in my first, first class uh, at university. It was Economics 101. And um, I remember the uh, professor getting up on stage, you know, think of this, the first class, first day, first everything at university, right? And uh, the, uh, the economics professor gets up and asks, what's the purpose of business? Well, actually, let me ask you, you know, how would you answer that question? Well, I guess if I was coming from the textbook, it would be, you know, to, satisf- to, to, make, to return value to shareholders. It, it, precisely right. Yeah, profit to shareholders. And I was like, oh, I get it. I, I get it, you know, but I, you know, is, uh, do most stakeholders who interact with the business give a shit about profit to shareholders. I mean, most employees aren't shareholders. They don't care. Uh, definitely no vendor cares, no consumer cares. I mean, you're talking about a microscopic little sliver of people who interact with the business who care at all about profit to shareholders. And that was a big turning point for me to say, well, wait a minute, shouldn't the purpose be what it produces or what it makes and how the world is affected by that? And then profit is uh, important, but more as an indicator uh, uh, of health, right? Um, and, uh, uh, you know, so as I'm mentioning our view of profit, right? So we are profitable, I would say relatively strong and growing. Um, but we take uh, all that profit and reinvest it uh, back into more innovation around waste. So, uh, for example, this new platform loop, which we just launched uh, 14 months ago, it's been a year before that in development. Um, uh, effectively, all of the profit that has come off of TerraCycle over the past few years have been plowed right back into enabling that platform to exist, which is this an amazing journey around how to shift global consumerism to reuse. Um, and that's how we intend to keep using our profit. I've never taken a dividend payment. Um, don't there's intend no, there's to. no Zaki yacht, yacht. No, it's, I mean, what's the point, you know? Um, uh, it's, uh, you know, <laughs> you can always, I mean, this is the thing. Like I have, you know, some friends I've met, you know, throughout the years and developed that are incredibly wealthy. And I find it very funny when, you know, you, when they have the second, third and fourth home, um, the headaches rise exponentially, and it's not actually that wonderful, right? Um, you know, well, I, I think there's this great study, right, that says, look, when you're making incredibly little money, the next dollar you get paid is going to materially increase your happiness, right? So money does drive happiness, let's be clear, but it caps out at about, in say, in a U.S. standard, about 70000 a year in income. After that, the next dollar does not drive incremental happiness, and, uh, you know, I found this in my life, all the material things I want, I already have, um, uh, everything I ever dreamed about is, is, is there. And it's not like an opulent life. It's just, you know, uh, we can also now access things much easier than ever before. You know, we don't need a second home. You can go on Airbnb one and have a wonderful experience and then get a different one the next time and so on. Um, you know, this idea of the sharing economy has a, a created the ability to not have to own everything and to rate our status in society by our accumulated stuff. So after a certain point, wealth honestly just becomes like a video game score, right? And sure, you'd love to have the highest video game score, but that's a, not a really profound reason to accumulate wealth. You know, I uh, really think the, the, to me, the idea of wealth, whether it's, you know, controlling a business that, you know, has resources or personal resources, is how can you, again, affect the world for the better? Um, how can you sort of leave your stamp on it in a way that the world says, I'm glad you were born uh, and walked on you know, my surface, not the opposite. And I wonder how, how many of us, the world would say, I'm glad that we existed, right? I wonder if it would even be thankful that humanity existed overall. I don't know, but um, I'd at least love to try to reconcile to the positive side of that, you know, uh, versus the, versus, uh, just be an impact and something that uh, is regretful to have existed right yeah and did this philosophy so so i can see that turning point where you're questioning this value of um 
of, of what's the purpose of a business. But before that, were there any identifiable moments that had you become well, who yeah, you are today? Yeah, I mean, for me, my story began, I was born in 1982 in Budapest, which uh, at the time was still communist, uh, you know, under the Iron Curtain. And, uh, you know, people in the West love, you know, sort of shitting on communism and saying how bad it is. And, you know, there's, look, there's pros and cons of capitalism, pros and cons of communism. Um, but there's a lot of interesting virtues about living in a social uh, system. You know, uh, uh, people aren't that into accumulation of wealth. I mean, you couldn't be, you know, but you're much more into how you're contributing. You know, the most noble profession in communism is being a physician, right? Um, is that the most noble profession in capitalism? You know, I don't know, right? And uh, so there's a lot of interesting things that I think instilled in me early on in that setting. But of course, you know, grass is always greener on the other side. So uh, Chernobyl happened in 86. Uh, the borders uh, uh, weakened and my parents, uh, you know, left. And we ended up uh, after hopping around Europe, trying to gain uh, effectively political asylum, uh, ended up in Canada. And I fell in love with entrepreneurship and everything to do with capitalism. And I got to tell you, it wasn't honestly for benevolent reasons. It was make lots of money and all those things I never had, right? Um, and uh, uh, I realized that, you know, through hard work and a good idea, you can. That's sort of the American dream. You can go from, you know, nothing to success. Um, and I'm glad I actually discovered that early. You know, I started my first company when I was 14. It wasn't like tremendously successful, but I learned about entrepreneurship. So by the time I got to university. What was that I, company out of interest? What was it the was, I mean, I remember this was back in 1999. It was a web design company. It wasn't okay. like anything special now, but it was back then. No one had a website. I was able to get real corporate clients, at, you know, and uh, invoice. And, uh, you know, I think at age of 14, I had, you know, the first year 15,000 in revenue, which is pretty good at that age. You know, so I got some of those things out of my system, and that's what I think allowed for a little bit more utopian uh, point of view by the time I was, you know, now going to get really serious about it, which is, you know, I mean, I TerraCycle, the idea for it came up in uh, my freshman year of college, and I left uh, by the second year, uh, and that was 17, you know, years ago now. Um, but I'm very thankful of this, you know, of, of, of falling into this. I'll give you other metaphors. Like, so w we're sitting right now, it's a pretty cool building, but the location well, is true. Uh, go on, yeah. sorry. Go ahead. I was no, just no, going to say, say for people, yeah. go on, no, carry on, carry on. <laughs> no, go ahead, go ahead. I've I was just going to say, as, as you mentioned it, of course, you're, you're surrounded by plastic bottles or walls made of plastic bottles for those who are just listening. Um, so maybe you could tell the story of that whilst you talk about your location. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So we are in, um, uh, you know, I was going to first start with the location, Trenton, New Jersey. Yeah. Now, Trenton, has, uh, is today uh, uh, one of the poorest and dangerous cities in the United States. It is everything you could think of as an American slum goes, you know, very, uh, 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 you know, visible minorities, black, Hispanic, uh, crime center, heroin center. I mean, the murder rate here is scary. I mean, just to give you an example, six months ago, I was at a uh, art festival, like an art festival, you know, with people, community, you know, uh, folks uh, having paintings. I mean, we're not talking like a hardcore rap music festival or you know, art festival and I was there with my uh, uh, one of my sons who's four and uh, we left and 30 minutes later 21 people were shot right where we were standing right so it's a tough tough town right and uh, you know we believe every aspect of what we do should drive uh, purpose and so we located our headquarters here in Trenton um, and so you know we're about a uh, uh, hair under 400 team members uh, and half work out of this uh, this office and, you know, uh, uh, here's an interesting embodiment of how purpose reinforces capitalism, right? Um, it is very, very purposeful to be uh, a business in a really tough city like this. We're one of the only companies here. 30% uh, of this town is foreclosed, 30%. And uh, so it's a, you know, it's, it's a big deal to provide tax revenue and jobs and all those things. Um, uh, but it's also the cheapest rent you can possibly get. We're an hour from Manhattan, an hour from Philadelphia. We have people who live in New York City who come work here. And, um, you know, I kid you not, it costs, what it costs to buy a building in this town is the same as what it costs to rent a building just 10 miles away from here for one year. And that's the comparison, you know, and we get uh, all sorts of amazing, you know, applause and support for, uh, for being here. You know, politicians come through here all the time, um, you know, uh, helping promote, you know, what the company's about. So you get all these other corollary benefits. And so you could even say it's a selfish decision to do this, you know, so sometimes purposeful decisions are incredibly profitable ones. Um, you know, if you were, it's, it's, a, it's still, uh, uh, you know, very early here, so uh, it's uh, dark outside. But if we went outside, 
um, you'd see our walls are covered in uh, graffiti, you know, but this graffiti changes every week and it's incredibly beautiful uh, artwork. Um, uh, uh, you know, we opened up our walls to, you know, local folks here to come and paint anytime they want. Um, uh, because of that, we've never had a crime instance in almost 20 years of being here, not one, for a very crime-laden area. And literally every Monday I come into a building that's brand new, which uh, our team members love. And, uh, you know, every, you know it, it only creates positive. So it's so interesting how you can reinforce this because many times I think, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the traditional capitalist approach would never consider doing the type of things we do. But isn't it funny that it actually benefits, you know, the things that traditional capitalism cares about, which is the PNL. Right. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's extraordinary. Yes. And I can imagine that. Yeah. How, how you're viewed by the community, right? That the people must appreciate the decision yeah. you've taken, the risk you've taken. They also appreciate that you open up the walls. And so, so yes, I can see that you must be really quite unusual in your, in your area. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, this plays out over and over and over this idea of how to re-embody purpose and, and monetize. So for example, many people spend money on marketing, right? It's a very traditional thing. Our marketing department is a negative cost marketing department. Uh, it actually drives profit. Um, the thesis of that department is, you know, why pay to be the advertising when you can get paid to be the content? You know, by having this sort of, you know, amazing uh, sort of purpose on everything, um, people really want to talk to you and hear about it, you know, so, you know, that once, I mean, I think we average, I kid you not, I think around 40 articles about this business every day. That was the average last year, uh, every day. Uh, uh, it's wow. unbelievable. Um, and then when you start getting written about a lot, you know, people say, well, can you write books or can you do a TV show? And we've, we're not doing it now because we're incredibly busy, but we did uh, four seasons of a uh, TV show that airs in 21 countries, you know, and every episode, you know, a big check was given to us which ironically is a big advertisement on our business, right? And again, it's all self-reinforced, right? And this is what I really try to teach uh, entrepreneurs. If, it's, if, if they're traditional entrepreneurs, um, you know, that are seeking just wealth creation, right? Want to be rich, which is fine, I understand. Uh, then it's uh, how do you really think about the purpose of your business and really center on that? And that'll actually help you with your wealth creation goals. And if you're the other side is sort of interesting, if you're a social entrepreneur, is how do you accomplish your goal, not in the context of a nonprofit, but in the context of a for profit, because you will accomplish your goal in a significantly bigger way and you'll do it faster. Well, that's an interesting point. So tell us about that. Why do you think you'll accomplish your mission in a more significant way and faster if you make yourself a profit? Absolutely. So there are a couple of reasons, right? So one is pragmatic. Um, governance of an organization is much easier as a for-profit than a non-profit. So TerraCycle does have a, we, we started a year ago, a global foundation. So TerraCycle, we are a for-profit, just to be clear, but we also have the TerraCycle Foundation. And uh, so I've experienced what it's like to run a non-profit. And for example, that foundation now does work in Thailand to clean up rivers and India to work with waste pickers. And uh, you know, we have to have a completely independent board of directors in Thailand, completely independent board in India. So just even sharing best practices and so on becomes uh, increasingly uh, more challenging versus in, uh, you know, TerraCycle, the for-profit social businesses in 21 countries. And I can mandate anything, you know, directly, right? You know, chain of command, right? You know, uh, please execute this. Um, so governance, that's an important one. Access to capital, right? Uh, imagine if you're a well-heeled individual that's looking to deploy some capital. Um, uh, uh, if I'm asking you from our, you know, say TerraCycle for-profit side, I'm going to ask you for an investment, which is going to get you a return. On the social, on the uh, non-profit side, I'm asking you for a donation. Which would you prefer to make? <laughs> so access to capital is monumentally greater in the context of a for-profit than a non-profit. And I say monumentally as well, be a hundred to a thousand fold more, uh, more access to capital. The capital, by the way, is also easier capital. So in other words, in the, if you gave me an investment, you'd give me the check, you check in from time to time, you know, but that would be that. Um, if you gave me a donation, you know, or especially a grant, the amount of paperwork and process I'd have to fill out consistently uh, would be uh, a huge amount of burden. You know, but isn't there our, a problem if I'm a capitalist and, and you're, you're putting all your profits back in and I start demanding dividends? Uh, well, there's two types of returns. There are dividends, which are, you know, distribution of profits over year. But there's also uh, the gain of your equity value, 
right? So while uh, uh, we haven't paid in TerraCycle Global a dividend uh, so far, uh, uh, many of our investors have made money between when they buy and sell their equity, right? So right, there's and two you're just, types of you're, ways. Yeah, and you're clear with them up front that this isn't going to oh, be yeah. a dividend pay. Totally. And, totally. And, it, but, and you still see that, that differential in terms of access to capital versus the non-profit. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's actually growing. This is the interesting thing is I think that uh, the, uh, what you would call impact investment, which is uh, capital that is looking to do good, right? Not just to gain a return. The, uh, the amount of investors that are looking to deploy their capital into impact investment structures is exponentially growing and there aren't the companies to find. So no, the answer is, uh, in fact, it's trending in a beautiful direction in the right way because people have found that I think that governments are not really, you know, uh, suited to help solve a lot of the big issues we're dealing with. Um, and they see the, I think the most powerful, I mean, honestly, the most powerful force in the world today, by far, uh, is business. Uh, if you think about how fast a business can affect people's lives on a global basis, I don't think there's anything more powerful. I don't think war is as powerful. I don't think politics is as powerful. Disease is not as powerful. Business is fundamentally the most powerful force today. And the problem is it doesn't have a compass, right? And so I think um, people have seen that. And a lot of people who've gained a tremendous amount of money uh, through business, you know, whether it was them directly or maybe their families you know, who accumulated a lot of wealth, are now thinking about how do you use that tool to try to shift the world back into a better position and sort of give it a compass, right? Because the challenge is if you serve only the God of profit, you may do some horrible things to serve that God. I mean, there's a, you know, here's a business model in the pharmaceutical industry, which is legal. You know, you can, you know, let's say you're a pharmaceutical company, we'll call you company A, and you spend a tremendous amount of money to develop a uh, life-saving uh, uh, treatment. And uh, let's say now you have a population of 20,000 or 50,000 patients that are dependent on your treatment to stay alive. Um, and let's say you're charging the fair price to recover for your R&D expenditures and make you know, a, a reasonable gain for your investors and all that. There is a whole business model where other companies come and acquire you and all they do is add a zero to the price. Yeah. Right? That is actually an a, a active business model in big pharma today. And it is phenomenally profitable because you, have a, you effectively have an ensnared uh, community that would die if they don't buy your drug. Right, so they will, and uh, they may go bankrupt in the process, and it's phenomenally profitable. But you know, is that a good thing? Uh, uh, I mean, I'm taking a black and white example, but there's many yeah. modestly gray examples in this, and it's really a lot of gray adds up to a pretty muddy situation. And uh, so I think there's a lot of so back to you know like the for-profit nonprofit again, access to capital is another one. Um, uh, 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 and here's the final one. It forces you to think about, this is if you run a for-profit versus a non-profit, a sustainable business model, right? In other words, that the work you do funds its own growth instead of relying on uh, external funding. Because here's a good example. If a for-profit company is reliant on external funding to keep itself alive, it means it's uh, in the red, yeah. right? And it shouldn't be. It should be in the black. So it should only use funding to get itself in the black, and then it should be self-sustaining. Right, right. Now that makes a lot of sense. And here's the point. You can do great work. I mean, many people walk into TerraCycle thinking we're an NGO all the time, right? So it's not the, the, the structure of whether you're a for-profit or non-profit is really just the rules of the game. It doesn't affect what you do. You can have evil non-profits, you know? Think of some of the non-profits that, you know, Trump has started as just one example that everyone would be aware of. So you have evil nonprofits. There's lots of nonprofits that are started by industry groups just to, you know, not create progress. So there's you can have evil nonprofits, you can have benevolent nonprofits, you can have evil for profits and benevolent for profits. The difference between for and nonprofit is just the rules of the game. It's not uh, in any way, um, uh, uh, you know, stating if what you're doing is good or bad. Right, right. Yeah, no, that makes that makes a lot of sense. And one one question that comes up as I'm listening to you and <clears throat> your critique of government here is, what do you make of the environmental movement? Because a lot of the time when I see that, that's a lot of angry shaking of fists generally at governments right but is that sure. is that the best place to direct the energy if what you're saying is true well so okay on on this i'm going to answer this a little bit differently because i think that in from an environmental point of view 
Um, yes, business is the most powerful tool for change, but the people who control business at large are ironically the individuals. And I know this sounds weird because they, you know, the individual uh, always thinks that they have no power, right? That it's big companies advertising to us, manipulating our desires, you know, telling us to buy certain things. But every environmental issue in the world, whether you care about um, climate change, the uh, devast you know, massive uh, mass extinction of our uh, flora and fauna, whether you care about water quality, air quality, whether you care about what I care about, which is waste, I mean, you name it. It all comes back to one action we do repeatedly every day, which is the act of purchasing something. And that is an individual action. You know, the, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, we're talking right now in this big corona epidemic, which is significantly lowering consumption. And I think the environment is, is applauding, right? You know, uh, every, you know, the environmental movement should be so happy that people are traveling, taking airplanes, not consuming, you know. Um, every single uh, thing in the world uh, that hurts us is linked to buying stuff. And that is an individual action. And we as individuals are in the driver's seat because what companies are looking for is to figure out what we want and give us what we want in the most exciting, convenient, and affordable way. They're not trying to convince us to buy what we don't want. That's incredibly difficult. It'd be like, you know, imagine me trying, you know, let's say you were an atheist, just, uh, and that would be like me trying to convince you to believe in God or vice versa. That is a phenomenally hard thing, and I probably won't succeed. I'd rather figure out what your beliefs are and what you want and reinforce them with all sorts of, you know, so if you believe in God, I want to sell you, you know, Bibles and things you can put on your wall that reinforce that belief, right? Way easier than the opposite. And uh, so we as individuals have all the power. We just don't wield it at all. And we need to think about the vote we cast multiple times a day for what we buy as the most important political vote we have um, because we have all the power. Politicians, I would argue, are you know, sort of there to um, you know, focus on the popular goals, right? Um, and, uh, and do what, you know, the masses have already agreed, you know, unique individually, and then enact that, uh, you know, once it's become a popular idea, right? So why did we ban the plastic straw? Because a bunch of people got pissed off about it. And politicians wanted to get the headlines that they have acted, you know, uh, uh, to support, you know, what their constituents care about. And so the plastic straw is banned. But it, was, it all starts with individual behavior. And we as individuals need to vote for the future we want with what we buy. Right. So your message to the to environmentalists is focus on your per purchasing choices. Oh, oh yes, first. absolutely. I think it's way more powerful and government than second. any. Yeah, the government will then honestly react to it. Once, let's say, you know, enough people are shifting their behavior, the government will make it law. That's not necessarily, look, I, let me be clear. Focus on everything, right? It's not about one bet. But I would say the, the area that we are least focused on in the environmental movement is the individual decision and helping individuals vote in the right direction. Right, right. Uh, and, I, and I suppose you could, you, one way to frame that was is, is almost forcing capitalism to be better. To be yes. more, by picking them, well, picking more of the purposeful company. Well, this is it. The consumers, right, are voting for what businesses should live and not live with their money right yeah. it's not that a business can just exist on its own you need it to be constantly fueled by the vote of consumption yeah 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 no it, it just as it hits me I, I i i'm immediately sort of flicking through all of my purchasing choices and do i always do i always pick the most ethical product when i'm in the supermarket and, so, and sometimes i do and sometimes i do don't but it's, yeah, it's true that yeah. i don't reflect on it as much as perhaps you're suggesting i should think about it this way here's an easy way to do it because i think trying to dissect the pros and cons of a product is really tough right and you can't i, I don't do it either all the time it's very hard very hard but think about it this way here's an easy sort of uh way to distill it next time you go buy something Anything you buy, two more will appear tomorrow. One to replace the one you bought and one to signify the trend. And anything you didn't buy, which is also an active vote, one less will appear tomorrow. And have that in the back of your mind when you pick you know, something up or, or don't. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And, uh, and I suppose from your perspective, it's also as part of that decision, consider the waste aspect. 
which is sure. in some ways yeah. even harder because then you're trying to think a couple of steps ahead. Yeah, and there's, this is an easy way to distill this too, right? If you're an individual, try to buy things with no packaging, if possible. If, uh, you know, so for example, you know, instead of shopping for a bag of sliced apples, just go buy an apple and don't even put it in a plastic bag, just put it in your shopping cart, you know? And you'll be healthier, by the way, for it, right? So, you know, try to buy things without packaging. That should be your first goal. Then if you can't do that, try to buy things that are in reusable packaging. Then if you can't do that, try to buy things that are in packaging you can recycle. And then try to avoid anything else. It's that easy, right? It's not, the goal here is not to complicate, actually. The goal is to simplify. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And then, and then what to do with your, your waste, which is where TerraCycle comes in, and maybe we should touch on that. So what are the sure. solutions that TerraCycle offers once you are stuck with you know, some amount of yeah. waste, right? Yeah, so if you can't do what I just described, then you would maybe buy something you know, uh, that may not be locally recyclable, and that's where TerraCycle comes in. So uh, you can go to pragmatically to TerraCycle.com, uh, and there, uh, find your country. You know, we're in 21 countries around the world running national services. And uh, you can uh, type in a waste stream that is uh, today not recyclable from, say, crisp packets to toothbrushes and cosmetics. And in many cases, we will be able to offer you free programs that are funded by, you know, say, in the case of crisp packets, walkers or uh, toothbrushes, Colgate or, you know, cosmetics, uh, L'Oreal, it doesn't matter. Um, and, and they're not going to uh, tell you only L'Oreal. Uh... Oh, for sure yeah. not. No, no, they will. So this is the beauty. They will allow you to collect any brand. You know, Colgate will allow you to collect any brand of oral care waste. What they're hopeful for is that when you go shopping next time, you vote for their product instead of someone else's. They're hoping you will switch. And that shows that the chances of you switching is increased in such an example. That's the reason they fund it. Let's be clear, right? And uh, so uh, uh, there's a lot of free programs. You know, these programs can be ones where you can become a collection location, sign up your school or your church or your uh, place of business. And I think we have now have a quarter billion people uh, participating in these various programs around the world. Uh, it could also be at retail locations. You can drop it off at a local retailer, you know, whether it's a Tesco or a Walmart or whatever it may be. Um, and then if there isn't a uh, free program, uh, uh, we offer paid versions of the programs. Basically, this, all this means is that we haven't yet found a sponsor to make it free. So you can fund it yourself uh, and cover the cost if you so wish. And that is, in a way, covering the cost of the externalities that we don't have to pay for. So, and actually, you know, surprisingly, people do. You know, it's been a big growing area of our business, which is the self-funded uh, models. Um, and then that's one way to interact with TerraCycle. And then you can, if you want to live a, in a reusable world, uh, you can uh, check out Loop, uh, which is uh, uh, in France, maboutiqueloop.fr, or in uh, the US, loopstore.com. And we're also coming soon to UK, Canada, Germany, Japan, and Australia all in the next 12 months. So you'll see Loop pop up there as well. And that's allowing you to eliminate the idea of waste altogether, which is shifting from disposable consumerism to reusable. And the nice thing is, and this is sort of a crazy irony, is that it also allows the quality of your products to greatly increase and the design of these bottles and packages to be significantly more beautiful, which is ironic to the selfish consumer, which we all are uh, even more important sometimes in sustainability. Right. So give a few examples of what, what comes with the, the Loop service or product. Or yeah, absolutely. So Loop right now is very much focused on what you would call in the industry FMCG or fast moving consumer goods. And this means like packaged food, packaged beverage, home care and personal care products. And, you know, in the past 12 months, we partnered with uh, most of the world's biggest organizations, you know, from Unilever to P&G, Pepsi to Coke and about 100 other companies at that scale who are all recreating their products and packages into these beautiful, durable uh, uh, versions. So you're Laundry detergent is now in stainless steel packaging. Your hand soap is now in beautiful glass and so on and so forth. And then we work with amazing retailers, you know, like Carrefour in France or Kroger Walgreens in the U.S. that we're about to launch with Tesco in the U.K. that then make these products available to uh, the individual consumer. And if it's uh, done online, you buy it online, we deliver it to you and then uh, pick up your dirties from your home, sort of like a modern day milkman. And uh, if it's uh, bought in store, uh, which comes a little later usually, uh, then you can also return to store uh, and get your deposits back. And it's sort of, it's actually not a new idea, to be very honest. This is how the world used to be before the 1950s. Uh, it's just taking that concept of reusable uh, systems, again, the way the world was up until about 70 years ago, and modernizing it uh, uh, and doing it really for everything, not just milk over here or you know, something else over there. 
right? And so if I were in the UK and I were with Tesco, I would they would have a selection of products that were all in this program. And then I'd I'd get into a rhythm with them in terms of receiving the product. You got it. Back my you got it. Yeah. yeah. Well, that absolutely. makes a lot of sense because I had a bit of a fail with this. There was my local market were were offering this refill service with um with bottles of um, shampoo and um, and shower gel, and I and I took it and 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 I found that with the bottles they were um. The, the labels on them washed off in the shower and we did it like a week. I couldn't tell which bottle was with ah. The whole thing was a fail. So I think there's something to be said for beautiful packaging that's because it needs to be more durable, right? If you're not going to dispose of it, it's, it's got to, it's got to last. It, it makes sense no, it to does. think it's it very that way. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And this is a key lesson is that it's first and foremost has to solve what consumers, individuals, you know, want first, which is performance. That's not just product performance, but your label not coming off, for example, right? That's a type of package performance. So, you know, it's got to work. It's got to be convenient. It's got to be affordable. Mind you, none of those are benevolent things. Those are all things that reinforce the selfish, in, you know, focus. Like, how does it help me, right? And then when we win there, then people will choose the better option uh, if there is a better option. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Um... And, and, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm so drawn to your story here and the fact that you're, uh, you're, you're doing this, as you say, as a business and uh, getting, getting all these players involved and not making them all wrong, right? Getting them into the tent and having them part of the solution. Like, well, this is to me sense. the fun part is how do we, I don't really believe in sort of evil actors, you know, uh, and many times I think in the social business movement, people project that these large organizations are, you know, uh, not so good. I honestly, everyone who works in these organizations are wonderful people. You know, they really want to do the right thing. It's just they're, the rules into which they have to behave may be challenged. And I think what we need to really do in this is we need to understand what the rules are that govern, you know, a corporate's decision, uh, an individual's decision inside a corporate, even a politician's decision, not necessarily, you know, hate those rules, except those that that's the way the chess, you know, the pieces on the chessboard move. And once you understand how the pieces on the chessboard move, you have a significantly higher chance of winning the game and wielding the game to do what you want it to do, even if you don't really agree in, or, or are inspired by how the pieces move. Right, right. Okay. Um, and for people listening to this, you know, who want to take action as individuals, so we've talked about the buying cho choices, we've talked about signing up to TerraCycle or presumably similar services if they exist in, in people's areas. What, is, is there anything else you would give as a message to individuals? Yeah, look, I think the most important thing as individuals is the way we vote with how we spend our money. So take that shit really, really seriously, right? Um, it doesn't mean you have to be an expert at everything, but just understand that you're voting for the future you want to live in or that you are giving to your children based on what you buy. And please keep that in mind. That is uh, maybe the most important takeaway. Then, you know, the best thing to do, ironic to all of what we're talking about, is don't buy anything at all. That's going to help save the world. Um, and then if you do buy, try to make sure that your purchase is helping the world become a better place and not uh, destroying the world one little step at a time. And I think uh, that will, you know, that, that compass may help us, uh, 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 you know, bring in and usher in what we, uh, you know, what we really, uh, uh, you know, want to try to bring. And I think if we do that, then companies will react and start creating products and services that reinforce that style of behavior. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, so much for your time and for for coming. Oh, oh before we go, we must tell us about the bottles, man. For those. Uh, what, oh what well. So around me are. I mean, look, all of our offices around the world are. Uh, I'll give you a little sort of view here. Are made entirely uh, from waste. Um, so whether it's the used bottles that make up some of our walls here, um, you can uh, you can even go right through them, which is sort of fun. Um, you know, but you can see that like, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the desks are all old doors, uh, the dividers are white vinyl records. Here's just a little bit more of a example of what wow. this particular room yeah. here looks like. And there's every room in this office space is every single detail, uh, is made uh, completely from waste. So it really tries to embody Amazing. what we're all about. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And, uh, okay. So that's, uh, and, and you found, do you, do you, do you construct it yourselves with the staff or do you? There is no, it, yeah, we do. We do. We have an internal design team because there's no design house that would do this. So uh, our internal designers have designed these spectacular offices all over the world. And uh, 
Yeah, I mean, here's the fun part. Talk about, you know, the purpose. It's the cheapest type of interior design. And the New York Times recently called our office uh, one of the most inspiring offices in the United States. Um, and it was super cheap to make and really reinforces everything we're about. So you can see how it all sort of comes together. Well, and the, and the negative, they have a negative cost marketing again, right? You've got the New York Times coming to your office, writing pieces on you. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Wow. Very, yeah, very cool. And, uh, and how does it rub off in terms of, you know, in terms of the people culture, what do you notice? You know, this is the big human podcast after all. What do you notice in terms yes. of human interactions within the company? I guess because it's all, in some ways it's all you've ever known. It might be a difficult question to answer, but is there anything you No, can but I, you know, look, I, I will tell you because we work with almost every major corporation in product and retail space out there. So we know, you know, we're in their offices all the time. And I think what comes out here is, um, you know, there's a lot of transparency, you know, people are really excited, you know, to come to work. Um, uh, we get a lot of folks who stay here for a very long time. You know, it's not rare to find someone who's been here for 10 years. Um, interestingly, we're also majority female by staff. Uh, so we do attract, uh, uh, more of a female team member than a male team member. Um, uh, it could be, you know, who's attracted to purpose. I think, you know, men over the age of 18 sort of suck, uh, unfortunately. Um, that's the reason our world is where it is. Uh, you know, kids are great. Women are great. Um, men's got, you know, men, men have to improve, uh, greatly. I said it's ironically as a man, um, over 18, of course. Um, so, you know, those are some of the interesting learnings, but I would say that the, uh, uh, you know, people only love, uh, working in an environment like this. It's, a, it's, it's not just fun, uh, but purposeful, dynamic, you know, high energy. These are all things I think everyone craves in uh, what they do with most of their lives, which is where we go to work. Right. And, and you think that starts with the purpose, the oozing oh, yeah. purpose, oozing through the culture? Well, our, our purpose is to eliminate the idea of waste. And I think you can see it physically embodied in the office space yeah. as just a yeah. visual example. But yeah, it starts with purpose. Without that, you sort of don't have a center point to, uh, to, uh, you know, to, uh, to gravitate around. Right. And that, and that infuses the place with energy and dynamism. Yeah. Sure. I think the male thing is is an interesting one. I mean, I had a, I just to be honestly, I had a bit of a visceral. Oh, hang on, hang on, I'm I'm a man. I don't think you know. I mean, there may be ways that I I think I can improve, but what, yeah, what? it's it's statistically true though. But what do you mean by that? Because that could that could sound a little sexist, right? It well, In fact, it know, does sound but, sexist. <laughs> yes, but many times, you know. Uh, you know, stereotypes and so on are based on, you know, accumulated data, right? Um, so in this example, it's, it's exactly what the demographics say. Um, if, you care, if you look at, for example, who cares about buying sustainable products? Who cares about recycling? Who cares about the environmental movement altogether? Who cares about sustainability? It's uh, boys and girls under the age of 18 and women over the age of 18. And who doesn't give a shit is men over the age of 18. And the data doesn't lie. And that's in every country around the world. Okay, so you're you're specifically talking about males caring about the environment. Sure, but also not yeah. just specific to the environment. You know, if you look at you know the percentage of people who are vegetarian, vegan, it's an index way higher on women than on men. If you think about people who are you know higher likelier to donate to charity, it's an index higher on women than it is going to be uh, index on men. If you look at access to capital, when you factor that in, by the way because right? men also have more access to capital, so it could skew that particular example. But in all these things, when you talk about just generally being good, right, it skews uh, in that way. And, uh, you know, you can, uh, there's different reasons. I could come up with hypotheses, you know, uh, uh, on why, right? Uh, we can all have, make some, some assumptions, but that's what the data says today. And, you know, that's not necessarily, uh, it is what it is, right? So again, this is where we are. It's not to say it's good or bad but it's good to know, right? And then how do we improve upon that? And how do we think about that? So if you're, um, you know, both of us are men in that demographic that I'm you know, criticizing right now, and maybe, you know, we can reflect on that, not get angry about it, but reflect on that and think about how to improve upon that if we even care. Though right. demographically, we don't. <laughs> right. But it's interesting to think about, because I'm, it's interesting to think about why that might be. And is it something to do with, you know, certainly the legacy? Is Look, it could be. Male participation in the economy was higher and the rewards for participation in the, mm. in, in the economy were, were much more around what you call my, my selfish motivations. 
I mean, my, my thesis on this, if I had to guess, you know, would be if you go back even deeper, you know, you'd say, you know, women are mothers, uh, you know, women care for other living things more, you know, tend the village and the men go out there and hunt. And, you know, there's much more self-preservation uh, that you have to think about when you're out there hunting a wild animal or whatever you're doing. Um, and so I think it's also, you know, deep in our sort of nature, you know, uh, uh, this idea of caring for others versus self-preservation. And I think it was, you know, probably very logical and that that's how, you know, it came to be. Right. But maybe something we're hinting at here is, is using that if you masculine energy or male energy and direct it in a way yeah. uh, that has people build purposeful organizations. I think you can. Of I course, think you can. That's use... not to say that women don't engage in building purposeful organizations. No, it doesn't. But, but, but you know, that's you see right. my point. Yeah, yeah. No, and I, and I think you can, you know, capitalism is, uh, is sort of, uh, you know, you can even argue sort of a masculine idea in that very stereotypical sense. And, you know, how do you leverage that to do, you know, do good things? Again, I don't yeah. think there's bad people. It's just where we decide to care. Yeah. Right. Not caring is not necessarily an evil thing. It's just apathy. Yeah. And if you look at, you know, and if I think about sort of what men are capable of building, if you, if you think about, the, you know, the guilds and the um, roundtable associations, you know, men do build benevolent organizations, you know, sure. they have done historically, sure. they do today. So it's not as if we're not capable of it, right? No, no, no. And look, every generalization has exceptions. Yeah, but even but even not even on an exceptional basis, but even as a sort of as a as a part of male culture, right? I mean, I think you could you could point to sure, that. Sure, sure. No, no, totally, yeah. totally. You know, yeah. but I would say, like, if you know, again, this is getting too theor theoretical, but like, how many male associations are built to benefit the association? You know, like an industry group, or a, you know, and how many are truly benevolent? You know, like getting together and building a hospital, right? There are there are examples of both, and I don't know the data on this, but. You know, it's important to understand it's not just group building, but what's the purpose of the group? Yeah, and well, and I was specifically pointing to where people create those 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 groups that yeah, you know, totally. do, do do exist to, to to give back to the community. So it's 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 somewhere in the the, the it is yeah, in us. It's uh, it's as males. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it is absolutely. Yeah, uh, it's a question of um, yeah, how we direct it. But but I think I think this is. You know, and and I do I do think that this is a big opportunity for this movement towards purposeful businesses is, is is a big opportunity to male to to perhaps yeah. engage males especially in um, building a better world. Yeah, I think so. Why not? It's a great opportunity, and you can make some money along the way. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay, Tom, thank you so much once again for the mini tour, getting up so early to make this call. Um, and uh, and giving yeah giving 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 us the opportunity to have this conversation given all the media requests it sounds like you have so yeah very oh, it's time. absolutely my pleasure it was a lovely yeah. chat and we'll put the we'll put, so we'll put the links to TerraCycle we'll put the links to the to the to the book for those who are interested in imaginal cells which is a great collection of essays uh, any and anywhere else to, to check out TerraCycle.com is it any and Loop you said any anywhere else you'd point people into no I think those are a good place good place to start excellent. All right. Thanks again. Great. Thank you for your time. Great to connect today. Thank you. Thank you.